Good morning from windswept Chicago. Um, my name is Lyric Hughes-Hale. I'm your moderator today. I'm also the editor-in-chief of EconView and welcoming you to talk about a topic that I think trends throughout this entire conference, but the way that we're going to focus on it um, on the next frontier from regulation to a trust-based economy is by having our stellar group of panelists talk about either their country, their region, or their particular industry and how trust and trustlessness fits into that. So I'm going to kick off the discussion. I'm going to ask each of our panelists, by the way, to introduce themselves and talk for about five minutes. And I'm hoping we'll have some time left at the end for questions and answers. But I'm going to kick off by um, giving you one of my favorite paradigms that, that um that relates to regulation and trust, which is the difference between central bank digital currencies and true decentralized cryptocurrencies. So of course, um, central banks issue money and based on trust, because we're off the gold standard and the silver standard now, um, they operate under laws and regulations. Uh, one of our speakers, Karen Petru, is an expert on the Federal Reserve and regulation, uh, banking regulation in general. So I know, she, and she'll be our last speaker, so um, please uh, wait for her uh, comments on that. But central, decentralized cryptocurrencies are quite different, and they're referred to as trustless currencies. But actually, they're regulated too. They're regulated by code and by the consensus of the people who utilize them to um, that's needed to change that code. So for example, Bitcoin has not changed, um, but there have been many forks of other cryptocurrencies and those come. So the rules there are the rules of physics rather than the rules of law. And I think it's interesting to look at that as, um, a, 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 as a divergence in the way that the world is, is maybe evolving towards further or less regulation more or less trust. So um, I'm going to ask Nina uh, to begin. And uh, uh, Nina Angolovska, the former finance minister of North Macedonia. So Nina, as a central banker, how do you, is that a good paradigm for you? Or how do you look at this issue of regulation and trust? Uh, thank you, Lyric. Uh, just a brief introduction for, for the audience. Uh, I started my path when I was 21 years ago as an entrepreneur. I graduated as student of the year and got some small awards, like a grant uh, at a business plan competition to start my business. So I launched the leading e-commerce marketplace platform in uh, North Macedonia back in 10 years, 10 years ago when e-commerce was almost non-existent and the company was recognized as the game changer. And I have been lucky enough to see the, to have seen the private sector as well, the public sector. I've been always right. pushing for change from the outside. I was also uh, president and I co-founded the Macedonian e-commerce association four years ago. And uh, then I was invited uh, by the prime minister to join the government as, uh, uh, as, I think an act to recognize the potential of young people and to give them a chance to change things from the inside. So this was actually the key motive for me to join the government uh, as a non-party member. And um, of course, nobody knew that COVID would come and uh, that it would make uh, a hell of a year. So I was navigating and heading the public finances during the biggest crisis of all times. And to come to your question and to comment on the issue, I would say that the coordination that we had with the governor of the central bank, because uh, we are not, I was not part of the, of the central bank, of course, as a minister of finance, but very good coordination was, uh, was needed to navigate better uh, during this, uh, this crisis. So we designed all the, all the measures from the economic and fiscal side. And I would say we did a pretty good job in that un uncertainty. Uh, but to, to come back to the issue that we are discussing and, uh, today, I think, you know, from a practical and point of view from what I've seen, on one hand, I have these friends that were digging and that have cryptocurrencies and three of them actually lost their cryptocurrencies like big money. And uh, their, of course, vision is that we don't need regulation, we don't need the government, this is the space where we are, you know, safe and secure. 
uh, where we don't need the, the authorities. And on the other hand, once they got robbed practically, either because they lost their phone or because uh, they got hacked, um, then they say, but there is no one to complain. Where should I go with this? And there is no, no <laughs> where you can go, you know. So uh, I think that this triangle that you mentioned uh, between the regulation, technology and trust is actually a very tricky one. And uh, I think that one of the best quotes, uh, that one of my favorite ones, is from the famous statistician Deming, uh, Deming that says, in God we trust, all others must bring data. And I would say that, you know, in, in God we trust, then technology definitely, I believe, should be monitored and regulated. And I said monitored because the pace of technology is so fast that regulation cannot keep up. And here mm -hmm. we come to the uh, to the question like the egg or the chicken, but we cannot develop regulation for something that has not been yet developed. And this is why regulation should be a partner of tech development. And this is how regulatory sandboxes were developed as an answer to this question. So I think that the process of co-creation is very important, that governments watch very closely what is being developed in order not to trail innovation and create a regulation that would fit innovation, but also protect consumers. So I think I would say I love and believe in technology and I think that is key to economic growth and can make our lives better and our society smarter. But however, believing and trusting is, are different issues. So we, we often ask ourselves, is this app secure and safe? And there is, I think, no binary answer. It's a no yes or no question. There are like 50 shades of gray on this scale. So ranging from totally insecure ending with like good but not perfect. So technology is never 100% sure. So I think studies, recent studies actually show that the trust in technology is declining, especially in emerging technologies, and governments do not understand emerging technologies enough to regulate them effectively. So this right. is especially the case in our country and in, in my region. So I think we are at an inflection point. We need to recognize the impact of technology on society they're not confined to one sector of the industry, but has become truly embedded in all aspects of our lives. And it has been never more important to ensure public trust in technology and its providers. And at the same time, it's never been clearer that this uh, trust is built on shaky foundations. So um, I think although this approach is complex and fragmented, there is no time to wait for global consensus to emerge. So businesses need to adapt to the current regulation and comply while keeping an eye uh, that standardization might come and they should be ready to, to respond. So for, for the end on this topic, to capture the triangle with a practical local and example from my country, this is something that has been scandal for the past two months. So uh, there has been a Telegram group called Public Room and there are over 5,000 people in that group and these people are sharing pornographic material from young uh, girls and from women uh, along with their private data, like contact and phone and address, without them knowing about it. So these girls are being harassed by dozens of calls and messages, and they blame the authorities for not taking any action, and that there were protests during the past months. And this case was investigated by the Ministry of Internal Affairs, and four people were detained. And then the minister says, we will gather all the data, and we will hand the case over to the... Uh, ombuds, uh, ombudsman. And on the other hand, the ombudsman says, but we don't have a regulation that treats these topics, so our hands are tied and we, there's nothing we can do actually. So the governments are now, the authorities are now discussing on how to quickly make amendments to the current law so they can act upon uh, and take actions. And the government tried to reach and communicate with Telegram, but the minister says they were not responsive. And only upon the Prime Minister went on to send a warning that they will disable Telegram for North Macedonia. They have deleted this group, but there is still no openness from Telegram for further cooperation on the topic. So basically what we can learn from this case is that regulation is needed and it will help in building trust in technology and in protecting consumers. And we also see and we can learn that governments need to speed up the creation and regulation to catch up with the new development. So we need a new agile way to designing rules and regulations. It's not enough just to delete the group. In fact, it can happen again. Actually, this is the second time that this group was reactivated after a year when it didn't get enough traction from the media and from the government. 
So to conclude my remarks in a broader sense of the topic, uh, you know, there many societies rely on distrust driven measures to regulate behavior, like do this and comply or not, if not, we will be punished. Uh, but I think that there is no size fits all solution. It depends on the culture, on the society, on the level of development, on the topic that should be regulated. And I would say in my country region, I definitely think we need penalties and this kind of rules in order to build trust. So, however, I think regulation should be definitely designed in a new way, in a more intuitive way, so that we don't ask entrepreneurs and innovators to read the small print, but rather to be able to be a partner in this and co-create and regulate and make it easy for them to follow and to comply. Wonderful. That's really a great perspective. Thank you, Nina, very much. So I think that... Um, uh, uh, this issue also involves freedom of expression and information and data flows. It's, it's, it's quite complex, actually. But I, I think very few officials have the level of knowledge of technology that you do. Uh, we have a lot of lawyers, don't we, in central banking in particular. So, Greg, um, how do you respond to what, uh, Nina, uh, what Nina said? And um, from your region, from Asia, uh, how do you see this unfolding? Well, both of you mentioned something that uh, inadvertently about in God we trust and everything. So I've got to tell a little story about that. But a bit before doing that, I should say I'm quite a confused guy. Uh, so because my background is basically in uh, mainly in insurance uh, on boards of like AIA and Generali. Um, and they're usually the ones that are very, very slow at adopting anything that, uh, that has to do with technology. And it's very difficult to try and get them to come into the 21st century, uh, cause many of them are still back in the 20th century. Uh, but, but I think, uh, I got to just tell a little story from what, what both of you said, um, back when my son was a teenager, uh, and he, he was on the phone to me and he said, dad, um, the, uh, the, the, in America, it's supposed to, it's all the currency is supposed to be backed by the gold standard, right? And I said, yes, it's supposed to be. He said, but I have heard that actually they've got rid of most of their gold. And I said, well, do you have a US dollar there? And, uh, and he said, yeah, yeah, I don't get it. So he went and got the US dollar. I said, you see the picture of George Washington? And he said, uh, yeah. I said, read me the words that are above the picture of George Washington. And the words are, in God we trust. And that's what <laughs> the currency is. So you don't have to wait for Bitcoin to come along. The U.S. <laughs> has been printing money for years. And, and we still trust the system because there isn't too much of a choice. However, I think that what is happening in that particular area is – with, uh, I mean, we're talking here a lot about uh, about Bitcoin and the the other currencies like Ethereum and some of the lesser ones, but actually, what we've got going on uh, and very actively going on now is China is developing their own digital currency, and under the last administration in the U.S. under Steve Mnuchin, uh, it was pretty much ignored. But my understanding is that the new administration is actually looking very seriously now under Janet Yellen at developing a digital currency for the U.S. And that is really into the new future of, of where we're going. And, and you could actually, in a way, call it a cryptocurrency, but in a very different sense. But if I can just digress now for a minute, uh, all of you would probably know Edelman's. And Edelman's every year do a trust barometer. And we, we are fortunate that they've just published the trust barometer for 2021 a couple of days ago. So if you bear with me, I'm just going to, uh, I, I sort of noted down some of the, the things that they uh, had uh, highlighted. And, uh, and I'll, just, I'll just tell you what they did in terms of, of trust. So what actually they've concluded is that business is now the most trusted source, which really seems quite odd. Uh, when you when you look at the different uh, the different ways that trust is supposed to be developed through government or NGOs or whatever, but it's actually it's actually business comes out. So um, the they showed that actually for business, sixty one percent 
of their respondents uh, trust business, and that's up 2%. Government actually is still at 53%. They did, they did get an increase, uh, but um, it showed that there is now widespread mistrust of the social institutions and the leaders. Interestingly, out here uh, in China, um, they've, they've shown that trust in government a year ago before the pandemic was 90%. That trust is now at 72%. And because I think all of you are sitting, in, well, no, sorry, Nina, you're not. <laughs> the others are sitting in the US. Um, they also give a figure for the US and the US trust was 53% and it's now down to 48%. So uh, another interesting one that they've highlighted is trust in the media. And it shows that uh, for social media, the trust factor is only 35%. That's pretty low because we've got so much fake news and probably because of the last administration in the US, uh, quite possible. Um, for owned media, the old style media, the trust is not that much better, but it's at 41%. And the interesting thing, as I said, was business is the one that's really being uh, pushed into the into the area of people requiring it to do something. And 86% of people want CEOs now to speak up on the social challenges. Um, and so what they want these guys to do, uh, and, and I'm using that generically, obviously, uh, is to build trust. They have to uh, guard information quality. They have to ensure reliable information goes out to employees and the community at large. So this is, this is very interesting, the way that they have been able to show us that trust is actually diminishing and not increasing throughout society and how they are now really, really hoping that someone other than government will take the lead in rebuilding trust. Um, so maybe I can... It's fascinating it data. Out. So back to data, yeah. right? <laughs> in data we back trust. Now, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, Robert, um, what are your thoughts about trust and regulation coming yeah, from no, the financial uh, services sector? Right. Yeah, thank you so much. And I, I guess trust begins on a very personal level. So let me give you a little of my background uh, to justify what I'm uh, about to share. Um, so I, I've spent my whole career working with financial institutions uh, in the global markets, um, you know, as a banker, as a consultant, as a uh, technologist uh, in different parts of, of my career. And I come to that global perspective uh, very honestly. I was born in Washington, D.C., but carry two passports. One is American, the other is Italian. Uh, I uh, studied in uh, the U.S., but also in Innsbruck, Austria, and Bologna, Italy, and Spain. concept. And when I look at it from a, well, when I, when I see that Elman uh, statistic and hear that business is, uh, you know, 61% and higher than, than government, it's not surprising. If you look at uh, ESG, which uh, is very important uh, globally and, and in finance, uh, the, the large corporations, uh, the big banks uh, are leading efforts and, and way ahead of at least where the U.S. has been. Hopefully with uh, the new administration, uh, we'll, we'll take a more proactive effort there. But trust, how's, how's it built? How do you lose it? What's, what's important? Well, when I put a regulatory uh, filter on that, I, I get back to my risk management days, and I mentioned this lyric. Um, and the question uh, that I always threw out was, why do race cars have brakes? And it's so they can go fast. And if we want to build and grow an economy, um, you need trust in that economy. Uh, and we haven't done a great job institutionally of earning that trust. And what, what is, what, where are the breaks? 
what, what will allow us to go fast. And it's a supportive regulatory environment, one that keeps us from doing things that we shouldn't do, but also allows us to grow and, and, and prosper. Um, not an easy needle to thread. Um, and in, in, in my area and uh, globally, you know, the, the banks are so much in front of the regulators. And, and, and that's not surprising. You know, 15 years ago, before we had the great financial crisis, um, everyone was hiring astrophysicists uh, to, to do their financial engineering project, uh, uh, products. And I always found that when I went in and talked to a banker and I didn't understand what he was saying, it wasn't because I was stupid. It was because he really didn't know what he was saying either, but he said it with such gusto and, uh, and confidence that he got himself in trouble. Uh, and, and the banks can hire the best and the brightest, whether or not they really are the best and the brightest is, is debatable. Uh, I don't think they often are. Uh, but how can the regulators compete? They, they can't hire those people. And, and the best people I see in, in regulatory institutions, uh, you know, in the financial services sector are, are those financial services professionals who decide I'm going to rotate into a, a major job with the New York Fed or the Bank of England or, or the ECB, um, a little harder than the ECB because they're more bureaucratic and bringing people from the um, member banks, uh, the central banks in, but um, and get five years of experience and then go work for a consulting firm or, or, or go on boards. Um, so they're really at a disadvantage, but it doesn't make their role any less necessary, um, you know, and, and it's, it's everywhere I go. Uh, it, it's about trust. My first meeting this morning at 630 was with a group of uh, Christian men uh, and, and Catholics. And, and it, it, the discussion was about the confessional. Now, if anyone who knows anything about the Catholic church, um, you know, who in their right mind is going to trust uh, a priest? Uh, sorry, it's my face. And, and, and I'm going to go in there in that little box and tell them everything I've done that's been terrible and wrong? Uh, I don't think so. But, but it, it requires a degree of trust. How do you build that trust to, to go in there and, and have a, 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 you know, a miracle occur where you're forgiven for your sins and you feel better about it? Where's that trust going to come from? Uh, you know, then, then I was in this uh, major sales and, and strategy session with, with my firm. And, you know, how, how do I get major financial institutions to invest hundreds or tens of millions of dollars in transformational technology, um, you know, with, with my firm? Um, we happen to be the best solution for these institutions, but how do you build the trust? So... In every walk of life, my, my wife, who's in the next room and is a leader in healthcare, my God, is there trust to take these jabs or shots into your arms with a vaccine? Uh, not so much. <clears throat> so, so while I didn't come into this discussion with this concept, but this whole concept of trust and what it means and how essential it is to democracies to our daily life, to our business lives, our personal lives. It's just so essential. I'm going to leave it there, uh, but look forward to the, the exchange. And I'm very interested to hear what Karen has to say, because she's always worth, worth your time and effort. So thank you. Absolutely. Karen, we're, we're really looking forward to hearing the, the view from Washington. Thank you. Okay, so... And, and Karen, um, you know, I've read your book and I did um, actually a podcast with you recently, which was very well received. But we talked about some of these issues. How are you looking at being close to the regulatory apparatus and seeing how it, it the sausage making machine in Washington? How do you see um, this topic of trust um, as part of it? Uh, thank you very much. Um, it's a real pleasure to be on this panel. Um, and if you ask about trust in Washington, I, I think Greg put it very well up after the last administration. The United States has never been one that trusted much in government. We're 
the last major advanced government to establish a central bank in 1913 because a fundamental fact of life in the United States is populism, progressive versus populism. There's something called the Democratic Farm Labor Party in Wisconsin that was a little of both, that was a huge force at the turn of the 20th century, and we're very much the same now. In Washington, that's a huge issue for governance, and it's also a critical issue for the trust essential to financial regulation. I agree with Robert. If, if you're going to trust me in my comments, let me tell you quickly that I'm the um, managing partner, a longtime head of federal financial analytics, and we're a consultancy that advises large financial services firms and central banks. And the book that you both mentioned, Robert and Thurik, it's my first. It was a nights and weekends project. I, I didn't need I didn't need something else to do. But it's called Engine of Inequality, the Fed and the Future of Wealth in America. Because the more I worked on the question for our clients of the post-2008 regulatory and monetary environment, the more convinced I became that a profound, if unintended, consequence of that was economic inequality. Now, the United States has been growing more unequal ever since 1980. Thomas Piketty's very important book, Capitalism in the 21st Century, documents that quite well. But it stops too soon. The data ends in uh, 2010. And that was the year after the financial crisis had ebbed. Post-crisis monetary and policy, ultra-low interest rates, quantitative easing with a huge Fed portfolio, and the safety net underneath the markets, the so-called green spend put, took on new and far greater proportions because the crisis had ebbed, but crisis policies continued. And at the same time, the whole Basel III U.S. version called gold-plated versions of the Basel III capital liquidity resolution rules, all those came into full force starting in 2013, but we knew they were coming very early on. And banks redefine their business because fundamentally banks need to make money. They don't have investors. They're gone. They know that they're profit-making machines. If you follow the money, not the model, which is one of the key messages of my book, don't, don't look at to see what the Federal Reserve intended. Look to see what they did. Banks are now much, much safer, U.S. banks. We saw that in March of 2020. But they're different. There are wealth management machines and trading platforms. And the basic business of financial intermediation, deposit taking and lending, has moved out, much of it, not all, much of it has moved out into so-called shadow banks, non-banks. And while banks are far more resilient, the financial system is not. At this, so how could you trust that? It's an asymmetric high-risk system in which the Fed resolutely asserted as late as November and February, November of 2019, February of 2020, that the fi financial system in the U.S. was rock solid due to the banks, and it never saw that the financial system didn't depend on banks. So the Fed has a major, despite the message on the money, Greg, the Fed rightly never, never has been liked in the United States, never has been fully trusted, and now has a significant issue. It's, it runs the payment system. It took that over in 1980. And the payment system in the United States, dependent on the Fed, very hard to compete with the Fed, is one of the slowest and most anachronistic in the world. And we saw that again in full force in 2020, uh, when uh, the government tried to send stimulus checks urgently into the economy and the payment system collapsed. Now, in part to solve that, comes what the important development lyric mentioned, central bank digital currency, in which central banks would take the fiat currency, turn it into digital currency, to try to capture the speed and the efficiencies of digital currency without the unregulated risks to which Nina drew such important attention. And we have to ask ourselves, do we trust a monolithic central bank, payment, deposit taking, and indeed perhaps lending system. Now, there's been a lot of talk. For example, if we have something called Fed accounts in which, uh, which Switzerland has um, experimented and discussed as well, 
in which the Fed takes the deposits, could we have still a, an intermediating private banking system? Or would the Fed also have to, to make loans? Could we trust it? Would we expect it to make loans for green bonds and social welfare programs? But what if in a particular government, what you did wasn't liked or they didn't just like you? Do we trust the government with our personal information to the extent that um, we would want it not just to know our tax returns, but everything about our bank accounts? Now, to the extent that the choice is between Facebook and the Fed, I'll take the Fed. But I think that's a false choice. I think we can evolve in the United States and I think in other nations, too, to a trusted digital currency system without the risks that Nina discussed and even greater risks. What happens if Facebook, with its 3.5 billion customers, really does develop Libra into the crypto global currency and payment system to, to which its ambitions seemingly vaunt it. Do we really trust a company that's also trying to sell us lots of things to use that information in our interests, not even with regulation, which is, is always one step behind? Is that a good idea? So I would just close by saying trust is an important value, but we have to remember that in systems with the profound economic inequality of the United States and many other nations, we have huge populations of vulnerable people. If one paycheck goes awry, even one small check goes awry, bad things happen. The payment system and currency are the bedrock of trust in the financial system. We forget about it because we are so used to taking that dollar bill out and using it because it is truly a currency that is a full medium of exchange and storehouse of value, the two criteria by which we judge money. In my book, in Chapter 9, I have an extensive discussion of exactly this issue, of what is money and how do we trust it. But I do believe that we are going to evolve to a central bank system, but what kind and how deeply it reaches into our pockets, quite literally, and into the economy, through the essential mechanism, the plumbing of the payment system is a vital question, not just for trust, but also for financial stability and economic equality. Thank you, Karen. Um, Greg, I, I, I wonder if you could compare and contrast what Karen has described about the United States in what's going on in China. We know that, for example, Ant Financial's IPO was scuttled and that recently um, uh, Xi Jinping himself said that, there, that um, other kinds of platforms, financial platforms within China should be on notice to be careful and mind their, I guess, regulatory P and P's and Q's. But it seems that of all the countries we're talking about, the ECNY, the Chinese di digital currency, is furthest along in, in development and um, uh, maybe because there is more tolerance for the lack of privacy that that kind of currency, as, as uh, Karen was uh, describing, would bring. Um, how do you see what's going on in China? Is there, are the um, intermediary banks being disintermediated? And is um, China's financial system becoming quite centralized compared to others? And Greg, I was going to ask this you something or ask uh, Karen something uh, from a U.S. perspective, but it's equally appropriate from China perspective, and that's the role of data and privacy. Uh, right. And uh, you know, it's a huge problem in the U.S., less so in Europe, more so in in China. But uh, if you can, you know, weave that in as well to the comment, or we can throw it open after your comment. Thanks. Well, so I'll start at the end. China has just. <laughs> just uh, enacted new privacy laws. Uh, but I think you have to put privacy there in inverted commas. Uh, mm -hmm. As long as, as, long as uh, it doesn't interfere with the party, which of course is paramount, then you can have privacy. But other than that, uh, I'll move on to other things. Uh, so so um, one, thing that, one thing that we have to mention in this context 
I think China has become innovators. Now, we all think of China as pinching technology and especially U.S. technology. And, and that's, what, that's what the trade war should be about, not about uh, soybeans, etc. cetera. But, uh, but the, the technology that China has now developed is really a challenge to the U.S. But let's just talk, let's just talk about one part of that technology, and that is the cashless society. And so you asked me, Lyric, about comparing it. And uh, as, as I, I think I heard Karen say, you know, the U.S. dollar and the transactions that, that you do in U.S. dollars are paramount to the way in which society works. Well, that's not the case in China anymore. In fact, if you carry cash in most parts of China, you won't get what you want because the vast majority of people, and we're not just talking about the elite here, we're talking about the vast majority of the population have adopted the use of mobile phones for a cashless society. And how does that happen? The government, of course, becomes more in control. Do the people really trust that system? They don't have a choice because the, the government has introduced it. And just like what we mentioned before about their work in the digital their own digital currency but that's taken on a different level the cashless society is taken on at the level of their own population the digital currency is now meant to be much wider and actually to see whether trade can take place in that digital currency so when you see them you see the chinese talking about joining the cpecc i think it is uh, then they're hoping to be able to influence those countries and then get them to introduce their own cashless method through the digital currency. At the moment, the yuan is only 2% of the global currency system and, of course, far, far, far behind the U.S. dollar. But it can't be discounted, and I think that's why the new administration in the U.S. is actually taking this seriously and just starting to look at whether a digital currency can be used in in uh, the U.S. as well. Did, did that answer your question, Lyric, or not? Yes, thank you. And Nina, would you like to jump in um, uh, with the perspective from Europe? Uh, I think comparing to the other regions uh, where from the other panelists are coming, uh, we this region is highly underdeveloped in all these aspects that we are talking about. That's why uh, I was uh, sharing that government, especially in developing countries, are not following the regulation and the pandemic, but not following the, the, the current development of technology. And what we see, what this pandemic has taught us is actually that it has revealed the weaknesses, the, pre uh, the pre-existing weaknesses of our society. And uh, regardless if it's about crypto, artificial intelligence, machine learning, we are speaking about very, very low basic digital skills of the population to, you know, understand, to try to self-protect themselves, to have a higher, a higher knowledge of, uh, of technologies. And I'm not proud to say, but North Macedonia is actually uh, like the, on, the, on the bottom of having uh, very low overall skills of the population. Uh, so um, I think that, uh, you know, we have been, I was, when I was Minister of Finance, I heard one of the uh, topics being discussed in the past uh, minutes was the, the, the importance of cashless society and how do we get there. And uh, I think that uh, we still, so, so our society still relies heavily on cash and this pandemic has shifted this and all the measures that I was designing as Minister of Finance were actually directed towards cashless payments and all the assistance that we were giving to the citizens was via the payment cards, you know, to change the habits, to make a more systematic change because we know how hard is it, it is to transform systems. And we have like, I feel like we have moved a bit the system with the pandemic, but you know, they're dinosaurs and they have the natural tendency to go back to their comfort position. And I'm uh, afraid that things will go back to normal. <laughs> one of the, of the system and of these outdated and bureaucratized ways of thinking and doing things. And we need, uh, definitely we need for governments to awake and the technology is actually pushing and doing this. 
And this is the case that I shared with uh, the media is, is, is definitely making a, you know, a push. And then it comes to the government. And now the goal is that they feel they have to do something about it. And they have to change the things in order to, for them to respond. So uh, I, I really, as I said, I think technology is magical and it's beautiful. And um, regardless if we are speaking about uh, whichever new things that are coming and will be coming, uh, and, but I, I still think that it's, it's, you know, it's more difficult to change people than technology. It's easier to change technology. And uh, <laughs> I, I, I really, it goes back to education, doesn't it, too? Yes. Yes, mm -hmm. and I, I really believe, and I think that uh, we will try to catch up, and we will. This is a chance to leapfrog, and instead of going all the phases of the technology development, we go to the late later uh, developments and uh, that has been going on. But speaking about fintech and cryptocurrencies and all these topics, we are just at the moment uh, the new law on payment systems w that will enable fintech solutions for the first time uh, will be adopted hopefully in a few months. It's in the parliament at the moment. Mm -hmm. So this is just to give you a comparison on how, you know, on, 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 the, on the development and where we are standing here in this region. So for now, the banks have this comfort zone. They're not innovating. They are, uh, you know, still having the, this uh, good position, that we would say. And now we hope that things will start moving. And this is the power of regulation. Once we open this, you know, then other companies will be able to join and the competition will be, will, will be increasing. And they'll be able to get investors because the regulations will be clear. So that's mm -hmm. a, another, yeah, right. Back to Robert's point that race cars have brakes so they can go faster. That's okay. right. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. So, Nina, I really liked your triangle of, Regu uh, regulations, trust, and technology. I think that's really what we've been talking about today. And also the critical point that regulators always, of, by definition, will trail innovators in technology. There's no way that they'll be ahead of them. So they just need to be close, at least, to them. Um, uh, one of the surprising things I learned um, was really Greg's comment about the trust in business uh, rather than government. And Karen, I agree with you. In the U.S., we are skeptical of government, and we have a federal system that you can see how it operated during the, pan the, the or pandemic. Not. So, <laughs> right. So, um, um, this idea that democracy and trust—maybe democracies need more trust than authoritarian nations, more like China, where um, the regulations are cl maybe clearer. And um, that also that um, technology is magical and we need to embrace it. We need to learn about it and not knowing about that. Um, I think the nations who, um, whose educational systems allow that will, um, they will be able to, to leapfrog. And um, overall too, I think about, there have been several comments about the pandemic and how that really accelerated some of the things we're talking about, going cashless, for example. And so it's very complicated, complex topics. Um, and Robert, I'm gonna give you the last word. How's that? Oh, that's great, thank you. Well, for, first, for all the people in the audience who have their hands raised, we're sorry we didn't get to your questions, but if you send them the lyric, I'm sure she'll farm it out to us. Thank you, yes, and, I will. And, and then, you know, um, the, the, the question of trust and democracies and competition. Uh, I, I really think Europe has an advantage because of their privacy laws. I think the U.S. has an advantage potentially because of the dynamic economy and the uh, democracy, which if we can ever get it to function. And, and I think China has an advantage because it's a you know authoritarian state. Sorry uh, for those who live there. Uh, but, but it gives them certain advantages. And the, the challenge is going to be for the democracies of the world to engender trust among their citizens, to um, unleash the economic capabilities that technology, uh, you know, offers to us and, and getting the most out of this as opposed to letting it take over for us. So maybe trust and verify. Thank you, Mr. Reagan. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I hope there's some further discussions. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Cheers. Bye.
Thanks, it was a pleasure. I'm the sales teacher. Matt. <laughs>